first pearl or the first point that I'd like to uh, uh, share with you all is okay so before we talk about refractory epilepsy we need to know what exactly refractory epilepsy is so what is uh, refractory epilepsy so the definition is that uh, so this is the definition actually we, what we use for pharmacoresistant or drug uh, resistant epilepsy uh, so it's uh, uh, where we where there is a failure uh, of uh, two anti-epileptic drugs uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, when they are used um, uh, either as monotherapy or in combination for a, a adequate amount of time and if they are used in a, in a, in a, a, a you know, appropriate dosage and if uh, a patient who's got epilepsy does not respond uh, to uh, these two anti -epileptic drugs, whatever the anti drugs, then we class this patient as having uh, refractory or pharmacoresistant uh, epilepsy. So what needs to be uh, uh, you know, borne in mind is that uh, the appropriateness of the anti drug or AED depends on uh, the pa patient seizure type and also uh, it should be, a, a, it, it, the, the dose has to be in a, a therapeutic dose and not a subtherapeutic dose. And there should be, and the, the patient should be uh, given the anti-epileptic drug for a reasonable amount of time or adequate amount of time for you to class these patients as uh, patients with refractory or ref, uh, pharmacoresistant uh, epilepsy. Now, uh, if you ask me whether is there a particular duration that we, we would consider uh, um, uh, patients to be classed as uh, patients with refractory or uh, pharmacoresistant epilepsy, uh, that's a little bit a bit controversial. There's, there's uh, there are a few schools of thought. Uh, certain um, uh, authorities actually suggest that it, it's two drugs for, and uh, if you have uh, a seizure frequency of two or more per month, and, and if it goes on for two years, then that would be a adequate amount of time uh, to call these or class these patients as refractory epilepsy. Uh, now there's a, uh, it's moving on, the, the, the duration is now sh uh, a little more shorter now. Now we consider even uh, even if it's one year uh, and a seizure frequency of one per month, uh, that might also be classed as uh, pharmacoresistant epilepsy. However, uh, as as we go on with the, with this talk, we would understand that this this is a very variable uh, definition, and it depends on a, a lot of factors. It is uh, multifactorial. Uh, so let's move on. So we, we'll come back to uh, the duration a little later on. Okay. So the first. Uh, Pearl is definition of refractory epilepsy. We've gone through that. Second point. Okay, so why two uh, anti-epileptic drugs and why not three or four or five anti-epileptic drugs uh, to call these patients or class these patients as uh, pharmacoresistant or resistant or refractory epilepsy? To answer that question, this is actually uh, 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 the landmark study, which was done in, I think, 2000 by Kwan and uh, Brody. Uh, and it is based on this paper that we actually uh, uh, consider patients with uh, to have pharmacoresistant epilepsy. Uh, and uh, in that particular uh, paper, they actually found that uh, after a first or one uh, anti-epileptic drug, or, which, is, which is monotherapy, they found that approximately 47% became seizure-free. And then after adding on or a, a sequential uh, anti-epileptic drug, uh, a further 13% became seizure free. As you can see in this uh, particular uh, pie chart, you can see that approximately 36% uh, uh, become actually pharmacoresistant. Uh, so it's based on this paper uh, that we decide that the definition is based on basically you need two and so the chances uh, if the patient uh, fails on two anti drugs the chances of uh, uh, seizure freedom becomes less and less and less as we add on anti drugs uh, so therefore uh, it, the idea is that if if you need more than two anti drugs to control seizures uh, the chances are that they will be pharmacoresistant and you may need to consider an, an alternative uh, treatment option. And I've suggested some treatment options here. Uh, 
All right. So that's why we, we have taken two antipeptic drugs uh, rather than three or four or five. Okay, so the third point is what are predictors of refractory epilepsy? So if you are treating patients with, uh, with epilepsy, you need to know, okay, right, uh, who are more likely to turn out to be refractory epilepsy? Um, and uh, so there are several predictors and these are the predictors. So if you have a younger age of onset uh, of epilepsy, uh, the chances, uh, chances are that uh, you, these, uh, uh, the, the epilepsy might be pharmacoresistant. Uh, if you have a high seizure burden, uh, and that's if you have one seizure, more than one seizure per month, again, there's a higher chance of, uh, you know, uh, the patient developing pharmacoresistant epilepsy. Uh, concurrent comorbidities such as depression, uh, again, is a predictor. And then also the quantity of interictal spikes. So the more spikes, uh, interictal spikes, uh, the chances of uh, uh, pharmacoresistant epilepsy is higher. Uh, so there are what you call a poly, uh, you know, where the spike load, there are epilepsies where the spike load is very, very high. And there are also the epilepsies where we call them oligospikers, where the spike count is very, very low. Uh, so the patients with a low spike count uh, actually have a, a higher chance of um, responding to medication. Okay, so is, if you have patients with these uh, attributes, the chances are that these patients might turn out to be pharmacoresistant. Okay, uh, the fourth point, uh, why is it important to diagnose refractory epilepsy? Uh, and that's because there's an increased risk of injuries, as you know, uh, uh, the more uh, uh, chance of injury and morbidity associated with uh, resistant epilepsy. There's an increased risk of mortality. Uh, and uh, the mortality is often uh, identif identified as uh, SUDEP or sudden, sudden unknown death in epilepsy. So approximately in any population, there's a one in 700 chance of uh, death due to epilepsy. Uh, and this is postulated to be due to severe autonomic dysfunction, uh, where uh, there can be a, a, a what we call ictal uh, asystole or uh, malignant arrhythmias as a result of ictus that can give rise to sudden death. Uh, that is the cardiovascular component. There can be also a respiratory component where there can be a, a sudden uh, apnea or uh, hypopnea due to uh, the CV autonomic disorder. That's called ictal, uh, sorry, apnea. Uh, so due to CV autonomic dysfunction, uh, patients are at uh, risk of uh, developing uh, SUDEP. Uh, 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 one other way of actually uh, identifying these particular patients who are at risk is uh, if the patient is again uh, pharmacoresistant, uh, needs multiple antiepileptic drugs, has uh, generalized seizures, especially nocturnal seizures, uh, which are uh, which generalize very quickly, uh, and also, uh, yeah, uh, so nocturnal epilepsies, multiple uh, patients on, on multiple antiepileptic drugs are at high risk of SUDEP. And if you do the EEG in these patients, uh, there is complete uh, post-ictal suppression, uh, uh, massive suppression, and you can see uh, a, a rapid change in heart rate uh, during video EEG monitoring in these patients. Uh, so this is one aspect. Of course, uh, due to, due to uh, seizures, you can sustain injuries and there can be an increased mortality, indirect mortality uh, as well. Okay, so uh, we've spoken about morbidity, increased morbidity, we've spoken about increased mortality, and also the psychosocial disabilities that uh, come about uh, uh, due to pharmacoresistant epilepsy has also to be considered, uh, especially when, the, uh, when there is pharmacoresistant epilepsy uh, with the increase in sp the spike population, there is also associated uh, cognitive decline and uh, uh, due to the abnormal networks that um, develop as a result of, of uh, pharmacoresistant epilepsy. So these patients uh, can have progressive cognitive decline over time, uh, uh, either due to the epilepsy itself 
or due to the multiple antiepileptic drugs uh, acting on the brain where there is a decrease of around 25% of cognitive capabilities just purely based on uh, the antiepileptic drugs that we use. The other uh, aspects are these patients are uh, at a higher risk of um, uh, uh, restrictions in education, they may be unemployed, there's also social stigmatization, and they also might have comorbidities, especially psychiatric comorbidities such as anxiety and depression. Uh, so based on these uh, aspects, uh, it's important for us to, to uh, uh, identify uh, pharmacoresistant uh, epilepsy, and you need to consider alternative options apart from antiepileptic drugs uh, in this special cohort of patients. Okay, so fifth point, uh, what are the init uh, initial steps in managing refractory epilepsy? This is a very important point, especially uh, when you are managing patients uh, with uh, pharmacoresistant epilepsy. If the first thing that if you think, uh, if, if a patient comes to you who's not responded to uh, at least two antiepileptic drugs, this is when the uh, process of classing them into, into this group uh, starts. Uh, before you actually class them uh, as pharmacoresistant epilepsy, you need to confirm whether this is indeed epilepsy itself. And there are many, many mimics of epilepsy of which I've given you a list of uh, uh, mimics. Uh, for example, syncope. Um, uh, you'd be surprised as to how many uh, patients who've been uh, treated for epilepsy actually turn out to be syncope. Uh, and that's because I think it's, it's important for us to actually take a good history. Um, we'll come to trying to dif differentiate syncope from uh, epilepsy a little later on. However, uh, I think uh, uh, time taken to uh, obtain the semiology is I think time well spent uh, because um, uh, these patients uh, who are often uh, misdiagnosed as uh, you know, having epilepsy may turn out to be syncopal. Uh, the patients may have uh, turn out to have syncopal attacks. The other uh, important differential diagnosis, you know, the pseudo seizures or psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, also called non-epileptic attack disorders or NEADs, are often misdiagnosed uh, as, as, uh, uh, as epilepsy or seizures. Uh, and uh, they may be an important cause for uh, pseudo pharmacoresistant epilepsy. The other uh, uh, differentials I'm not going to go through. Uh, and it's so important that actually, if you take wor the uh, worldwide figures and uh, an estimated 20% of patients referred to a comprehensive, com com to, uh, uh, comprehensive epilepsy programs turn out to be, uh, uh, turn out to not to have epilepsy. Uh, so it's actually one in five, uh, as as high as that. So it's uh, it's important for us to differentiate the mimickers from uh, true epilepsy. And this is a, a very important table. Uh, just uh, draw your attention to the uh, uh, the NEAD or uh, the uh, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. So if if the seizures are longer. Uh, long-lasting seizures where it goes on for uh, for uh, hours, uh, I think that's when you would suspect the possibility of a non-epileptic seizure. Often uh, seizures uh, self-terminate within two minutes. Uh, nearly 99% of uh, seizures do not last more, uh, more than a minute. Uh, the average um, duration is around 62 seconds. Uh, so if you have a seizure that goes on and on and on, uh, the chances are that uh, the, the uh, uh, seizure is of uh, non-epileptic origin. Uh, if it is gradually in onset and offset, again, the possibility is that uh, it may be a non-epileptic attack. Um, side to side uh, motions of the head and body, move, uh, pelvic thrusting, Again, uh, there is a caveat with pelvic thrusting. Uh, it is uh, at times seen with uh, frontal lobe epilepsies uh, and hyperkinetic seizures. Uh, so you need to be aware of uh, 
the possible caveats, but if you see that there, there's a uh, there's pelvic thrusting, the possibility of uh, non-epileptic seizure needs to be considered. Opistotonic posturing, stuttering, persistent eye closure, uh, if the, the eyes are, uh, you know, tight, uh, tightly shut during a seizure, the chances are that the possibility of uh, that that may be a non-epileptic seizure. However, you need to underst uh, understand there may be caveats with all these uh, physical signs that I'm enumerating today, uh, because at times you can have what's called ictal eye closure uh, or ictal fluttering, all of which uh, can mimic non-epileptic seizures as well. So you need to be careful before you actually uh, class these patients as non-epileptic seizures. Uh, ictal crying, uh, if the patient starts crying, weeping uh, during or after an event, that's a, a high predictor of, of it being a non-epileptic seizure. A fluctuating course, waxing waning pattern, and also asynchronous jerks, all of which are predictors, but not uh, absolute. These are, none of them are absolutes. Um, so, uh, Predictors of generalized seizures are if the patient turns out to be cyanosed or blue, uh, and uh, if there is an ictal cry associated with uh, the tonic phase, a lateral tongue bite, very high predictor of it being a, a, a true seizure. Uh, and if there is a posterior dislocation, uh, again, these are all highly specific for generalized seizures. Um, uh, unconsciousness, again, um, uh, if it is greater than five minutes, in the sense the loss of awareness uh, and confusion, if it lasts for uh, for more than five minutes and uh, uh, there is a gradual recovery, that is more in favor of a generalized seizure. Uh, sleepiness, aching muscles, uh, headaches, all of uh, uh, which can uh, be uh, experienced, which, which are experienced post ictally after generalized seizure. Again, my predict the, uh, the uh, chances of uh, a generalized seizure. Syncope, very important differential diagnosis. Uh, often um, misdiagnosed to have, uh, you know, patients with syncope are misdiagnosed to have uh, epilepsy. Is that they, they, if you really ask uh, these patients, uh, the uh, pre-episode or uh, symptoms such as lightheadedness, diaphoresis, the nausea, vom uh, the, feeling, the feeling of nausea prior to the event, all of which uh, are predictors of, of uh, possible uh, pre-syncope going into syncope uh, or vasovagal syncope. And also, uh, special, uh, you need to also uh, ask for the specific uh, situation in the sense uh, was the patient standing and have you, has, uh, is, uh, did the patient experience all these events while standing uh, or uh, certain situations say for example if if they, uh, the, the, uh, if after in an emo extreme emotional uh, context uh, or if the patient was uh, had seen, uh, say, for example, certain people when they see blood, they uh, they have uh, vasovagal syncope. So you need to uh, delve into the uh, specifics of of when these uh, uh, episodes occur uh, before you actually label these patients as having epilepsy. Uh, uh, Patients with uh, syncope, they, they recover very quickly and their orientation is very, very rapid. Uh, so uh, in, it's important for you to get a good history of the semiology before you actually uh, decide whether these patients have true epilepsy or not. Okay, so moving on. So uh, the first step, of course, is to de de decide whether this is true epilepsy or not. The second uh, step is, I suppose, to see uh, if the uh, to to assess if the uh, uh, whether the patient is on an appropriate drug and an appropriate dose, and whether the patient has been treated for an appropriate period of time, uh, and that's very important. For example, uh, so you need to basically class of uh, class your seizures whether this is actually a focal onset epilepsy that you're dealing with. Uh, or is this a generalized uh, epilepsy that we are dealing with, or it could be even a combination, or if whether this is an unclassified form of epilepsy before you decide on uh, whether the patient is on uh, an appropriate uh, treatment regime. Uh, 
so as you know, there are certain uh, generalized epilepsies, uh, sorry, there are certain drugs, anti-epileptic drugs, which are really contraindicated for certain types of generalized epilepsies or certain types of epilepsies per se. For example, uh, sodium channel blockers such as carbaspirin, oxcarbaspirin, um, phenytoin, trigabalin, calcium channel blockers like pregabalin and gabapentin are often contraindicated in uh, genetic generalized epilepsies and they can make uh, seizures worse. So you need to have that uh, background knowledge uh, to uh, class these patients as pharmacoresistant epilepsy. So you need to change uh, uh, the anti-epileptic drugs because it's uh, those, those particular syndromes, uh, the, those patients with this, these, those particular syndromes would be on inappropriate drug regime, uh, drug regimes. Right, so uh, these are the examples of what drugs to use in what type of seizures. So generalized seizures, you would, uh, the, the, you would use uh, broad spectrum antiepileptic drugs such as sodium valproate, limitized antopyramate, zonisamide, lamotrigine, and rufinamide, as well as ethosuximide, especially with uh, uh, absence epilepsy. Uh, I don't think ethosuximide is indicated in any, any other type of epilepsy. Uh, and then the first line drugs for focal or partial seizures are carbs, sodium channel, mainly sodium channel blockers, such as um, carbspin and oxcarbispin. Lamotrigine is more broad spectrum, but uh, is a sodium channel blocker itself. Levitized and zonisamide toclamate. So you need to uh, have an uh, knowledge on uh, what drugs you can use for what type of epilepsy before you actually class these patients as pharmacoresistant. So you need to see whether the patient is on an appropriate. So first step is, is this a mimic, uh, you know, seizure mimic or epilepsy mimic? Then is the patient on uh, an appropriate drug uh, for his type, his or her type of epilepsy? And then you need to find out whether there are any aggravating factors such as stress, exhaustion, sleep deprivation, alcohol abuse, which contribute to the refractoriness of the of the seizures, and I think the the the, the most important point in uh, in all this is uh, I've uh, put this in bold is problems with compliance, and that is one of the most common uh, causes of pseudo resistant uh, or pharmaco resistant epilepsy, uh, and often we find that most of the patients uh, do not comply with. Uh, with our drugs. And it's important for you to ask this question when you're evaluating patients with epilepsy is that you need to find out why they are, uh, first, whether they are compliant or not. And secondly, uh, why they're uh, not compliant. And that, and in most cases, uh, it's the side effects. Uh, and uh, we, we often, in our busy clinics, we forget to ask this from our patients, uh, whether the, whether uh, they experience side effects or not. And, uh, uh, and it's an important time, uh, it, it's an important question to ask and it's time well spent to ask a few questions that are specific uh, to, um, you know, the drugs, uh, to, the, the, to uh, the particular anti-epileptic drug. For example, if, uh, if the patient is, uh, you know, uh, aggressive uh, uh, after levitized time, it's very important that you need to, uh, to, to ask that particular question uh, because often uh, these questions are never not asked and uh, you know uh, uh, and it's um, uh, you know uh, the the anti drugs are generally uh, tapered by the, the 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 patient themselves because of the side effect profile so side uh, asking for side effects is very important and uh, the other component is lack of understanding. So you need to have a good rap rapport with your patient, good communication skills uh, to make patients understand that they need to be on anti-epileptic drugs to control their seizures. And also uh, they may have uh, problems with coping, uh, problems uh, coping with the illness and that, that also needs to be addressed. So non-compliance, one of the most important uh, um, uh, problems uh, which come about when you're assessing patients with pharmacoresistant epilepsy. Okay, so then we, we, we decide, okay, so patient has, um, this is not, the patient does not have a mimica. Uh, this is true uh, epilepsy, is on an appropriate anti-epileptic drug. Uh, 
uh, and is then the patient is compliant okay so then uh, are there is there a particular reason why this patient is pharmacoresistant so you need to find and in, in most cases in most uh, uh, epilepsy uh, the the pharmacoresistance is generally due to a focal onset epilepsy and these are the common causes that we generally need to look out for uh, uh, the uh, number one cause is uh, cortical uh, dysgenesis or malformations in cortical uh, migration tumors which are low grade tumors and vascular malformations um, sorry i just lost my what happened okay Okay, so uh, these are the usual suspects that we need to look out for. Uh, gangliomas, DNETs, uh, or dysembryoplastic uh, uh, neuroepithelial tumors, cortical dysplasias, avians, and cavernous angiomas. And you need a good MRI scan for this, uh, at least a 1.5 Tesla scanner uh, with uh, uh, specific sequences uh, such as uh, uh, SWI, uh, you know, is, is an example of of uh, uh, of a special sequence, and also um, uh, the uh, uh, finely uh, cut, uh, you know, so the 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 slice thickness also is very important because you need very, uh, uh, you know, uh, the thickness should be less than one point five millimeters uh, for you to have this kind of resolution. Uh, so you need a high resolution scanner to identify these subtle changes uh, which is necessary to uh, diagnose or uh, find a cause for, for these patients. So just an example of how subtle these changes are. These are focal cortical dysplasias um, as well as um, uh, hippocampal sclerosis and one of the most common causes of uh, pharmacoresistant epilepsy. Uh, so these are just examples of uh, of what we are looking for on uh, the MRI. Again, uh, hippocampal atrophy or sclerosis. Again, uh, one of the top causes of pharmacoresistant epilepsy. Why I didn't include the uh, in my slide uh, causes, the the top causes uh, being hippocampal sclerosis is that. Uh, sometimes uh, we attribute uh, erroneously uh, the focal onset epilepsy to uh, hippocampal sclerosis and uh, that may not be the case. So for example, the patient may have non-epileptic seizures, you do the MRI, you find a hippocampal sclerosis and you attribute the patient to have epilepsy due to hippocampal sclerosis and that's not always the case. You can have hippocampal sclerosis due to uh, any perinatal insult. So uh, you need to bear that in mind. So just because you see a hippocampal sclerosis on your MRI does not mean that this patient has epilepsy. All right. Uh, so the sixth point uh, is what are the treatment options available for drug resistant epilepsy? Very easy. Uh, so there are treatment options and the number one treatment option is epilepsy surgery. Of course, if the patient is um, not suitable for uh, epilepsy surgery, for example, if the uh, epileptogenic zone is within edicon cortex and uh, there's a lot of um, a functional cortex that the patient is going to lose uh, following surgery, uh, the, that may not be a patient who's suitable for uh, epilepsy surgery. For, uh, there are other uh, contraindications as well. If the patient has multifocal epilepsy, again, uh, patient may not be suitable for epilepsy surgery. So in, they, in those patients, they, we would generally consider uh, neurostimulation devices such as VNS, DBS, and Neuropace. These are all uh, uh, neurostimulation devices and the cheapest would be vagal nerve stimulation. Uh, and each type of stimulation device uh, is uh, uh, efficacious uh, uh, for different types of uh, epilepsies. For example, VNS is very good for uh, generalized epilepsies. Uh, and if, if you're having focal onset seizures, again, uh, if, if the patient has um, concurrent depression, uh, they, the uh, type of 
device that we would generally use is a, a VNS. If the patient has got anterior, sorry, if the patient's got temporal lobe epilepsies, again, uh, uh, anterior uh, ANT or anterior nucleosal thalamus uh, DBS. So the target uh, is generally the ANT for deep, uh, deep brain stimulation. Uh, so we would cho choose that type of uh, stimulation device for that particular type of epilepsy. And if, and also there's, a, uh, there's also the neuropace, which is called cortical uh, responsive and, uh, uh, stimulation, where we actually identify uh, an area in which the uh, seizures come from and we put in a lead to the area that we uh, that is supposed to uh, initiate seizures, and then we give a electrical pulse. Uh, that's called the neuropace device. So, all there are there are wide variety of neurostimulation devices that can be used for different types of epilepsies, and of course, not to forget the ketogenic diet, uh, commonly used with children, but can be used with adults. But uh, we may need to modify. Uh, the diet because it's uh, because of its tolerability and uh, I think the modified Atkins diet also works as well. Okay, so there are treatment options uh, for patients with pharmacoresistant uh, uh, epilepsy. The seventh point: Why is early referral for uh, for epilepsy surgery important? So there are the benefits of epilepsy surgery. And there's little question that surgery is and will for, uh, for the foreseeable uh, future remain the drug of choice for drug resistant epilepsy because uh, a randomized trial in 2001 demonstrated that 64%, there was a 64% chance of seizure freedom with uh, surgery, which is medically ref refractory, uh, especially with temporal lobe epilepsy is compared to just 8% with medical management. So there's a drastic difference between uh, the effect efficacy of of um, uh, resection or uh, surgical resection compared to that of medical therapy alone. Uh, there's a large number of people who were uh, seizure free following epilepsy surgery. So, uh, um, uh, so just to give you an idea of, uh, of the, the percentages of, of seizure freedom is that if, if, you, if a patient undergoes a, a temporal lobe resection, uh, the chances of seizure freedom uh, uh, over the next two years is uh, uh, 8 to 90 percent that are as high as 8 to 90 percent uh, and over a 10-year period that does drop to around 52 uh, percent 50 percent or so uh, however that chance is much much higher than uh, if the patient was uh, just treated with anti-epileptic drugs uh, so it's it's very effective in uh, controlling seizures. So the population-based uh, prospective studies show good long-term seizure, uh, long-term seizure outcomes after resective epilepsy surgery. Uh, the majority of patients who are seizure-free after five and ten years have sustained seizure freedom uh, since surgery. So the chances of so if they are seizure-free for uh, for five between five and ten years, uh, the chances are that they will remain seizure-free. Um, and many patients who gain seizure freedom uh, can successfully discontinue anti-epileptic drugs. So that's uh, those are the positives uh, that that epilepsy surgery can uh, offer uh, these patients who who's got pharmacoresistant epilepsy. Eight point: Who should be referred for epilepsy surgery? Very important. Uh, so any patient who's got disabling focal onset seizures with or without secondary generalization. Who, who has failed appropriate uh, trials of first-line anti-epileptic drugs should be considered uh, and should be referred to an epilepsy surgery center. However, you need to, uh, so what does adequate control mean? And that adequate control uh, of seizures can differ from patient to patient. Uh, so okay, for example, some patients may prefer uh, sorry, may find that even one to two seizures per year uh, might be too many, uh, considering their professional, uh, considering professional or uh, social reasons. Um, while others may not feel that uh, seizures have such an important or severe impact on their quality of life. So it depends on the patient as well, and also the balance of uh, of the probability of success following surgery for example uh, if the uh, if the patient has uh, a 
temporal lobe seizures temporal lobe seizures uh, the chances of uh, uh, seizure freedom is very high uh, compared to that of uh, uh, seizures, seizures that are extra temporal uh, so it depends on on uh, on where the seizures are coming from and the type of surgery uh, which will predict the, the chance of success uh, following epilepsy surgery Although uh, refractoriness is generally considered following one to two years of non-controlled uh, epilepsy, epilepsy surgery may be performed earlier in the case of catastrophic epilepsies, or, uh, epilepsy or a high chance of surgical cure. So if even uh, you may consider uh, epilepsy surgery much earlier uh, if the patient's got a very, very high seizure load uh, and it is affecting uh, their quality of life and there is a high chance of surgical cure. All right, so those are the patients who would generally refer for epilepsy surgery. How are patients evaluated for epilepsy surgery? Uh, so what we do generally is uh, we try to uh, uh, delineate the epileptogenic zone. So what's this epileptic, epileptogenic zone? It's a, very, it's a theoretical construct. It is the minimum amount of tissue that is necessary to render a patient seizure free once we resect that particular uh, area, okay. So, uh, and that's that's a really that's a retrospective uh, zone, uh, and that we that is often uh, diagnosed uh, after surgery. Uh, the other uh, uh, sort of um, definitions or uh, normally definitions of abnormal brain areas include iterative zone. That's an area of cortex where uh, there's there are the, uh, the uh, in, there's, there are intactal spikes, uh, and we call that the irritative zone. Uh, we have the ictal onset zone where we uh, we look we analyze the EEG to see whether where, where the seizures are coming from. The epileptogenic lesion is where the, the lesion that is uh, responsible for the epilepsy, and the symptomat uh, symptomatogenic zone is where. Uh, where the seizures start from an area which is non-functional and uh, in the in the brain spreads or propagates to the area where where there is function and there when when it propagates to involve areas of function that's when we actually see or uh, see the manifestations of uh, the seizure semiology so uh, that's called the symptomatogenic zone it does not mean that uh, uh, the by just analyzing the sim symptoms of uh, uh, or the semiology, uh, we, the, and and trying to localize the seizure may not be that the, the the seizures are coming from that particular area, or maybe that the seizures are coming from a remote area which is adjacent to uh, the area which is functional. So uh, it's important for us to understand that when we actually evaluate patients with uh, epilepsy, and then also the functional deficit zone, which is actually the zone which is dysfunctional as a result of uh, the abnormal network and not directly in, uh, attributable to the seizures themselves. For example, if a patient's got temporal lobe epilepsy then, uh, involving the uh, dominant uh, hemisphere, uh, the, the dominant uh, temporal lobe, then they may have uh, deficits in verbal memory uh, that which is not really attributed to the, the seizures itself, but uh, which might be useful also in uh, uh, in uh, localizing the the abnormal network where when, through neurocognitive assessment. So that's called the functional deficit zone, and this is a, a pictorial uh, representation of what we've just um, uh, discussed. So you can see that the epile uh, epileptogenic lesion. Uh, the uh, ictal onset zone and the symptomatogenic zone is generally often overlaps, but may not be in the same uh, area. And so, if you if you resect a large area, which is the uh, which is den uh, denoted here, uh, the we actually render these patients seizure free. Uh, the the area or the irritative zone is much larger than the a the than the epileptogenic zone. And also the, the functional deficit zone is much larger than uh, the um, uh, epileptogenic zone. So uh, this is a, a, 
a construct which you need to have in mind when when we are when we evaluate patients with epilepsy uh, very simply put pre surgical evaluation uh, is in often three parts uh, uh, when you need to basically analyze the semiology, see, uh, uh, so uh, uh, a good history and examination is very, very important. Uh, trying to uh, localize, lateralize as well as localize uh, the uh, seizures and, and decide on where these seizures are coming from. Uh, then you uh, combine that with the MRI. Uh, see whether the uh, the seizures that are coming in the general area of where the lesion is, and also a video EEG where we actually combine uh, uh, the analyzing seizure, the seizure semiology as well as the ictal EEG and the interictal EEG to uh, uh, sort of um, map out as to where the seizures are coming from. And if uh, all these come into play uh, in, in, and they are concordant uh, and they overlap. For, for example, if the intactal EEG uh, is suggestive of, a, of an anterior, anterior temporal lobe epilepsy, if the ictal semiology again uh, is uh, very representative of a, of a semiology that originates from the temporal lobes or, and the ictal EEG has a typical ictal pattern which is again um, uh, very, uh, very temporal, and the MRI suggests, say, for example, hippocampal sclerosis. Then we have what's called concordant data, and then we, we are able to uh, decide that this patient need, uh, will uh, has a high chance of uh, seizure freedom following an anti anterior temporal lobe resection. So, data concordance is very important when we. Uh, evaluate patients with epilepsy. There are other tests that we generally do, uh, which include neuropsychological testing. Uh, that's to get a preoperative baseline of their cognition uh, and also aid in localization. For example, if the patient has memory deficits, for example, if the patient has a verbal memory deficit, that's more likely to suggest that this patient may have a dominant uh, temporal uh, lobe uh, dysfunction. And that might give us a clue as to where the seizures are coming from. Uh, and also neuropsychiatric uh, evaluation to find out if there are any comorbidities uh, such as depression and anxiety, and especially if the patient has suicidal ideation, which would contraindicate uh, for surgery. Okay, so uh, if the, the data is not concordant, if they, there are areas where, where, where we don't find any concordance, then uh, then that's when we actually use more sophisticated um, testing, um, uh, such as PET scans, SPECT scans, uh, and even uh, functional MRIs to find out if uh, um, to delineate the, the seizure focus even further. Okay, so the last point. So what if everything fails? Is there anything else? Yes, we can always continue with uh, anti-epileptic drugs, uh, polytherapy, but it's it's important for you to understand that it should be rational polytherapy. And we would generally combine uh, and uh, uh, adding a further uh, anti-epileptic drug might actually help, uh, especially the newer anti-epileptic drugs because they, they, uh, they uh, offer newer tar anti-epileptic tra targets, novel targets, and also they allow uh, for you to be a little more um, uh, for the uh, for, uh, uh, because of their uh, side effect profile, they become more, more tolerable, uh, and then you might uh, the patient might actually patient's compliance also might uh, improve. So uh, combi combining uh, anti-epileptic drugs uh, uh, might be the way to go if the patient is uh, does does not is not suitable for epilepsy surgery or any other uh, option that I've already mentioned. Um, and uh, also combining uh, the uh, drugs which may be synergistic, for example, such as uh, lamotrigine and valprate or lamotrigine and uh, levetiracetam might have uh, uh, greater uh, effects on efficacy. All right, so I've, what I've done is I've spoken to you about, uh, I've shared with you 10 important pearls or points. Uh, we've gone through what refractory epilepsy is, the definition of it, and we, we've gone through why we, it's too, uh, uh, that we consider pharmacoresistant epilepsy as uh, 
epilepsy not responding to two anti-epileptic drugs uh, as to that of three or four or five. Uh, we've gone through uh, what are the predictors of, of, uh, of refractory epilepsy. We have, we've gone through what's why it is important for us to diagnose refractory epilepsy. The initial steps of managing refractory epilepsy, for example, uh, going, uh, you know, uh, analyzing whether these patients ha have mimics, whether the patient is on appropriate anti-epileptic drugs, whether the patient is compliant or not, uh, and if uh, what are the treatment options that are available for the for patients with drug-resistant epilepsy, why it's important for you to re refer these patients for epilepsy surgery early rather than late and who should refer and who should be referred for epilepsy surgery and uh, patients and how patients are actually evaluated for epilepsy surgery and uh, what to do if everything